All right, total depravity or total inability. Man cannot believe total inability, which is the Calvinist idea of depravity. Man cannot believe until God regenerates him and gives him the gift of faith. But the Bible does not say that faith is a gift from God. Okay, you've got Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 there. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And the Calvinist says, see, faith is the gift of God. Okay, now I don't consider myself a Greek expert. I took Greek in, in Bible college, and I have used Greek from time to time since then. Um, I had a guy staying in my home one time. And I said to him that faith is not the gift of God. And he said, sure it is. It says that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And I said, no, it doesn't. Okay, and here's something about Greek grammar. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Grace and faith are feminine, feminine gender. Okay, grace and faith are feminine gender. That and it are neuter. And the genders have to match. The pronouns have to match the word that is the antecedent for the pronoun. There's nothing here that's neuter. I mean, uh, no, no noun that is neuter. The pronouns are neuter. So what is it that is the gift of God? Well, the subject of the verse and the verse following, in fact, several verses there together, the subject is salvation. The subject is how to get to heaven. Remember Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the gift of God, not faith. Every one of you sitting here, whether you're saved or lost, every one of you is exercising faith right now. You probably never even thought of it. You are trusting those chairs. We used to have some folding chairs at Dayspring Bible College that uh, were not real trustworthy. <laughs> we were in a class one time. We're recording, you know, on video, and there's this guy from Minnesota, Tom Bowden, and he's sitting there, and you hear this snap, and all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden, Tom disappeared from the picture. <laughs> The chair wasn't trustworthy. He had faith in it, but his faith was misplaced. Okay? And you've got faith in those chairs. You're trusting them to keep you off the floor. And so far, so good. Okay? <laughs> faith is natural to people. We all have faith, and we put it in various things. You trust your car. I've had cars that I couldn't trust. I was praying on the way out to the parking lot, Lord, please let it start. Okay? Um, faith is not a gift. Faith is not a gift. Um, I gave you another verse there. Uh, I'm not going to read all of that. Uh, the last part of verse 3 uh, says, this is Romans 12, verse 3, According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Okay, but the subject in that passage is not salvation. The subject in that passage is spiritual gifts that he gives to believers, and he says that you exercise them in faith. Got nothing to do with salvation. Okay, many, many, many times Calvinists will use verses that are on a totally different subject. Okay, you just have to read the context, and you can figure it out, no problem. Um... Okay, regeneration, and we talked about this earlier, and other benefits of salvation always come after faith. Um, okay, Acts chapter 15, verse 7 and 8. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that for a good while ago God made choice 
among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Remember he went down to Cornelius' house and preached to Cornelius and his friends and they got saved. Uh, and God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as He did unto us. While Peter was preaching the gospel, they believed it, and God gave them the Holy Spirit. Okay, right then and there. Regeneration is when we receive the Holy Spirit and we're born again. So they believed, and then they were regenerated. And that's always the way it is. I, I was talking to a Calvinist one time and I said, okay, so you're telling me that a man is saved before he believes. Well, no, that's not what I mean. I said, now, wait a minute, is that what you're saying? And he refused to admit it. But if you're regenerated before faith, then you're born again, you're a child of God, you're on your way to heaven and you don't even believe in Jesus. That's nonsense. Okay? That's nonsense. You can't get to heaven without believing in Jesus. That's the only way anybody's ever going to make it. <sighs> okay. Um, how dead is dead? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. How dead is dead? And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And the Calvinist will say, a dead man can't do anything. Okay? Therefore, you can't even believe. Okay, now that's logic based on a phony premise. Okay, because physical death is not the same as spiritual death. Okay, when you die, your soul and spirit leave your body. Okay, and you may be laying there on the floor in a coffin on a hospital bed. Your body is empty. You are gone. You know, the real nut is gone. That's just the shell. The real nut is gone. <laughs> okay. Um, no, a body can't do anything because there's nobody home. Okay, the person that was in that body is now either in heaven or hell. Okay, and that body can't do a thing. But spiritual death is not the same thing. Spiritual death, you've got a spirit, but it has been separated from God. It doesn't enjoy fellowship with God. It's a, it has sinned, and it is separated from God. Can it still make decisions? Okay, don't put this up because of time. But think back. Okay, if you want to look this up later. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7 to 15. Adam and Eve have just sinned. And lo and behold, they're standing there and it occurs to them for the first time, we don't have any clothes on. And they're ashamed. They weren't ashamed before. There was no reason to be ashamed before. There was no sin. There was nothing wrong. But now they're sinners. They're ashamed. So they make themselves aprons out of fig leaves to cover themselves up. Then God comes to the garden, and what do they do? They run and hide. Okay? And God speaks to them, and they say, Here we are, Lord. Why are you hiding? Well, you know, we did something we shouldn't have done and we we're scared. Okay? They have a consciousness of their sin. They understand they're guilty. And now they're afraid of God. They used to walk and talk with Him and have a good time. Okay, so what does God do? He explains to them the curse. This is what's going to happen because you've done wrong. And then he gives them the first prediction of the coming Messiah, who is going to be their Savior. Okay? And from every indication in that passage, it seems to me they understood him. Okay? He's talking to them, and they're getting the message. But the Calvinist says that it's impossible to understand God. 
because you are dead in trespasses and sins. Romans 1, 17 to 20. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. He's talking about lost people. They understand the wrath of God. It's revealed to them. All right? Then, because that which may be known of God is manifest, where? In them. God puts the knowledge of God in the unbeliever. Every person that lives knows there's a God. Atheists have to be taught, just like Calvinists have to be taught. Okay, you don't get it naturally. Naturally, everybody knows there's a God. Um, for God hath showed it unto them. You know, they say that if, if no one has learned, then no one has taught. Well, if God has showed it to them, they must have got the idea. Okay? For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood. The Bible makes it clear that lost people can understand some things about God. Not everything, but some things about God. Even His eternal power and Godhead. They know He's a person. He's not a thing. He's not an it. It's not let the force be with you. Okay? He is a person with extreme intelligence and extreme power who made everything that we see. Okay? And lost people know that. So that they are without excuse. Okay? Um, another verse, Romans 2, 14 and 15. Um, which talk about the conscience that He's given us. Look at verse 15. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Around the world, almost all culture groups have the same basic standards of right and wrong. I mean, they deviate in various ways, but you go anywhere, it's wrong to kill. Almost everywhere, it's wrong to commit adultery, and so on. Because God has put that, the knowledge of the law, in their hearts. Okay? There's a lot of things that people can understand about God. People will use, Calvinists will use 1 Corinthians 2, that a man cannot receive the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't understand the things of God. But in that passage, verse 10, God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. There are things only a believer is going to understand, and a lost man is never going to get it because he doesn't have the Holy Spirit. But these are the deep things of God, not the gospel, not the fact that lost people are sinners bound for hell and they need to trust Christ as their Savior. Anybody can understand that if they'll simply think. When He is come, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on Me. Of righteousness because I go to My Father and ye see Me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Who is the Spirit going to reprove? He's going to reprove the world. Okay? The world. That's everybody. The Calvinists like to say it's not, but that means everybody. It doesn't mean the elect. It means everybody. Okay? He's going to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's going to enable them to understand the gospel. He's going to teach them some things, put some things in their hearts so that they realize they're sinners. You have to be righteous to go to heaven, and if you don't trust Christ, there's going to be a terrible judgment ahead of you. Okay? That is for every single person. And the Spirit of God does His work. Okay? He does His work. Lost people can and do understand the gospel. 
they have the power to decide whether or not they're going to believe it and put their trust in Christ. Some do, some don't. There's a lot of people that understand and say, that's not for me, forget it. Okay? I've, I've known a number of people that, I mean, I've known people could quote the gospel back and forward to you and say, but I don't believe it. Okay? So, you and I, there's, there's, there's obviously a couple of things here. To Christians, be loyal to the Bible. Okay, I want you to think about this. Everywhere in this country, there are Christian radio stations. You can get Christian programs on TV. Um, one of the things a pastor hates to hear and I heard this not long ago. I was talking to somebody, and oh, I just love Joyce Meyer. I watch her all the time. I stay up half the night watching Joyce Meyer. And I'm thinking, boy, don't you have any discernment at all? Okay? Now, I'm not saying Joyce Meyer's a terrible person, and if I sound like it, forgive me. I'm sorry. Okay? She's, she may be fine, but her teaching's not. Okay? But you can get false doctrine almost anywhere. In fact, it's hard to avoid it. Be loyal to the Word of God. Everybody that preaches to you, whether it's on radio or TV or from this pulpit or anywhere, they better prove it to you from the Bible. And if they don't prove it to you from the Bible, forget it. Okay, now every now and then a preacher will speculate on something, and if he identifies it as speculation, you know, I don't know this for sure, but I think, well, okay, fine. Um, but if he takes speculation, something from out in left field, and says, this is what God says, nonsense. Okay, be loyal to God and His Word. And if, if a preacher can't back it up with Scripture, don't have anything to do with him. All right, that's what you've got to do. Make him give you chapter and verse. When I was in Bible college, that's, we said that all the time. Chapter and verse. Somebody would say something, be a discussion going in class. Chapter and verse. Show me that. If you can't show it to me, forget it. Um, check the context of a verse. If they pull out something, you know, well such and such. We're talking about Calvinism and several of their doctrines. Read the verse before and the verse after and you don't have a problem with it. Okay, they can't prove it. And interpret clear verses by unclear. No. Other way around. Interpret the unclear verses. If, you know, somebody shows you something and it says elect or predestinated or something like that and you're struggling with it and you're thinking, wow, I wonder what that means. Well, guess what? John 3.16 didn't change. Okay? John 6.47 didn't change. All those verses in the Bible that tell you you get to heaven by faith alone and it's available for whosoever, you know, they didn't change just because somebody came along hundreds of years later and came up with some screwy doctrine. Okay, stick to the Bible. That's what you need. And if you don't know Christ as Savior, and it could be that everybody here is saved, I don't know all of you. I can't get my wallet out because my... Here. There's a chapstick. <laughs> Tell you what, this would be better. You can see it. Okay, here's my wristwatch. Let my right hand represent you and me. I taught Joe this and no. I didn't. Um, this is you and me. This is our sin. Okay? I think we've got a room full of terrific people. But every one of you is a sinner in the sight of God. Okay? You may be better than me. But you don't have to be better than me to get to heaven. You have to be as good as God to get to heaven. And you're not. Okay, don't compare yourself with each other. Compare yourself to God. And you do that, you find out that you're a sinner. Okay, now God loves us, but He hates our sin. To get to heaven, that sin has got to be gone. 
all gone. Well, I'll go to church. So will you be any better tomorrow because you were here today? Well, it'd be nice, but will you be perfect tomorrow? I'll get baptized. Well, that'll get you wet. You know, bring some ivory with you and it'll get you clean. But it won't wash away your sin. Okay, it's the blood of Christ that washes away sin, not water. God loves you. He wants you to go to heaven. You can't do it yourself. So let this hand represent Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. He came to the earth, lived a perfect life, never, ever, ever sinned, never thought a bad thought, never did anything wrong. He went to the cross and He took your sin and my sin upon Himself. He died. The wages of sin is death. That's why Jesus died. So He died and He paid for that sin. He was raised from the dead. And now if you will trust Christ, the Bible says you will be found in Him, not having your righteousness, but the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Okay? If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you need to understand that you cannot go to heaven on your own. You must have Christ. You can't help Him save you. All you can do is trust Him. Allow Him to save your soul, and He'll do that. Mm -hmm.